Cavalcade of America, starring Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Cornelia Otis Skinner. Presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Good evening. Tonight, Cornelia Otis Skinner and Douglas Fairbanks relive some of the American theater's warmest, happiest moments as Cavalcade brings you a radio dramatization of Miss Skinner's bestseller, Family Circle. Now, Family Circle, starring Douglas Fairbanks as Otis Skinner and Cornelia Otis Skinner as your narrator on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. think of when you hear the words star, famous actor, matinee idol? Does it seem that a man who's all these things is too fabulous to be real? Well, Otis Skinner was a star in the theater, a famous actor, a matinee idol, a fabulous person. And because he was also a wonderful teller of stories to a little girl who grew up bearing his name, I have a story to tell you now. It began on a day in the early 1890s when Otis Skinner was leading man to the great Helena Mojeska. So the agent said to me, you've got to be a success with a name like yours. Never heard of a funnier one than Skinner, <laughs> or Otis for that matter, unless oh. maybe Augustus or something like that. <laughs> oh, Mr. Skinner. And what did you say to him? I merely turned to him and said, sir, have a really good laugh. Augustus is my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Majeska, who, who, who's that uh, frightened-looking child that just came in? Who? Over there. Uh, ah. Oh, I have engaged her to play the engine you rose. Ah. She's Miss Derby. Isn't she lovely? Ah, yeah, she has a certain corn-fed charm. <laughs> Maud Durbin, from Mobile, Missouri, wearing a brand-new homemade peekaboo shirtwaist and a neat blue serge skirt walked shyly into the great bare stage of a real theater for the first time. When she saw the group gathered for rehearsal, chatting and laughing so much at home in this awesome place, she stifled a little gasp and whispered, Actors? Miss Durbin, good morning. Good morning. Good, good morning, Madam Majestic. I'm delighted to see you. Now come along. Before we start the rehearsal, I want you to meet all of my company. This is Miss Durbin, everyone. Oh, how are you? And here is Mr. Otis Skinner, my leading man, who thinks you are uh, very charming. Oh, dear. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Now, everyone is here. Shall we begin the rehearsal? Please. May I ask just one question first? Will I... Will I have to appear in tights? <laughs> yes, I'm afraid you will, my dear. It is customary in your role. But what am I going to do if Papa comes to see me? It's quite simple, Miss Durbin. For that night, just buy yourself a pair of hip boots. And that was the historic meeting of my future father and mother. Otis Skinner, who had appeared with the great ones, Joseph Jefferson, Edwin Booth, John Drew, and... Maud Durbin, who'd never appeared on any professional stage before. For two whole seasons, while Majeska's company was on the road, they were constantly together on the stage. Yet they might easily have been living in different hemispheres. Good afternoon, Miss Durbin. Good afternoon, Mrs. Skinner. Looks like a good house this evening, Miss Durbin. Yes, it certainly does, Mrs. Skinner. Miss Durbin, may I have a word with you? Why, of course, sir. Uh, you needn't call me, sir. It's not so very much older than you, you know. Really? Well, I could have sworn you were in your 30s. Mm, well, yes, early 30s. Now, about last night, you realize, young lady, that you ruined my entrance in the witches' scene in the theater? That is unforgivable. I'm awfully sorry. You see, I have the giggle. That is even more unforgivable. The theater is a serious business, Miss Durbin. Oh, please, Mrs. Skinner. It's just that last night... Yes? Well, you know the stage manager plays the second witch in Macbeth, and he forgot to take his nose glasses off. So I tried to stand in front of him. So you stood right in my way. But if the audience had noticed a witch wearing nose glasses, everyone would have laughed and spoiled your best scene. Mm, yeah. Yes, I, I see, yes. Uh, Miss Durbin, you showed great presence of mind in an emergency. <sighs> in the theater, that is very important. 
Yes, I even think you show promise of being a fair actress one day. Soon afterwards, Madame Majeska announced that she would not tour during the next season. Maud, who'd been her protege, was especially unhappy at the news. But she felt she'd have little chance of finding a place in another troupe. As for Otis Skinner, he'd long dreamed of organizing a stock company himself. He was jubilant at the idea of striking out on his own. He, personally, was going to bring drama to America's great open spaces. On the night of Majeska's closing performance... You wish to see me, Madame Majeska? Come in, Mr. Skinner. I wish to tell you how much I have enjoyed working with you. Thank you. I'm deeply grateful for all that you... I also wish to make the prayer that your new venture as an actor manager will be successful. I'm beginning to wonder. We're we're planning to tour the West, you know, and... and... (laughs) Look at this wire I just received from an actor friend of mine. What does it say? Oh. In spite of Horace Greeley, stop. Western prairies strewn with whitening bones of actors trying to get back home. Stop. <laughs> oh, you are a very fine and handsome actor, Mr. Skinner. I shall not worry too much about you making your way. <laughs> But I do make the suggestion, if I may. Oh, I certainly. What is it? Take the young Miss Durbin with you. Miss Durbin? Oh, no. Why not? Oh. I think enough of her talent to engage her. Why not you? Well, you see, I... I she even, is pretty uh, and quiet and causes you no trouble. Uh, except to giggle at the wrong time now and then, perhaps. Well, no, I, I'm sorry, madame. It will be quite impossible. I, uh, have, uh, I understand now. You are in love with her. Well, certainly not. I think no. you are. And you run away from the reality. You are afraid of the true emotion. Oh, my fine young man. You must not fear that because you are an actor, you dare not marry and have the family life of people in our other professions. This is very important if you wish to grow as a person and as an artist. Believe me. I, I, I'm sure you're right, madame, but uh, you Go see, to I her. have these... Speak uh... to her of your love. She will accept you, I'm I tell you, I am not in love with her or anyone else. Oh, man, man. And they say women do not know their own minds. Oh, go away. I want to hear no more from you. You are impossible. Well, why do you not go? I, I, um, I haven't found the right leading lady yet, you know. And, and You will and receive I... no more advice from Modeska, Mr. Skinner. Well, you, you really believe Miss Durbin to be talented? Yes, you? but I would not yeah. think of forcing her upon you. Oh, you're not forcing her on me, I assure you. I, it's just that, well, you... <laughs> I go uh... out of my mind, Mr. Skinner. Will you go and ask Miss Durbin to sign her name to the contract and never mention the subject to me again? was that Otis Skinner and his spanking new repertory company set out for the Great West with stout hearts and slim pocketbooks. As town followed town, the days grew lean. It seemed lovers of the drama were scarce. But the young actor manager took it all in his stride, a stride magnificently buoyant. For he thought of Majeska's words, and he looked at Maud Durbin, and he knew he was in love. You enjoy walking, Miss Durbin? Oh, yes, Mrs. Skinner. Only way to see New Orleans properly. Walk it. I agree. Oh, what is this part we're coming to? Oh, oh, it's a cemetery. A cemetery. Very old and very famous. Oh, and very beautiful. Mrs. Skinner, do you think the people here would mind if we stopped a while? The people of New Orleans are noted for their hospitality. Look. Look the way the moss drapes over the stones. And here's an inscription. Mrs. Skinner, do you read French? Like a native. Uh, now, let me see. Let's see here. It says, um... <clears throat> uh, toujours dans les coeurs, um, always in the hearts of the... Uh, let's see. Uh, what it say? Uh, always mm. in the hearts of these two, one dream. Always in their separate dreams, one love. Perfect. You have excellent eyes, Miss Durbin. I have? Do you really think so, Mrs. Skinner? Oh, yes, I really do. They're, they're deep and thoughtful. Always in the hearts of these two. One dream. And I think you're beautiful. And good. Always and in their separate dreams. One and love. And I love them. Uh, is it one love, Otis? Now and always, Maud. One dream. One love. Otis managed 
to keep his road company together until April. And almost the moment the curtain rang down on their closing show in Corning, New York, he and Maud Devin were married. They were radiantly happy. And it seemed to her that the future of the American theater was in their hands. And Otis, who never argued with her, quite naturally agreed. In the fall, they set out on the road again with a new company, playing Beyond the Vagabonds and Hamlet and... Otis, dear love, I've brought the papers. The write-ups are simply stunning. Oh, let's have a look. Yeah. Ah, well, let's see here, Donna. So they're carefully produced, yes. The effective costumes. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Hamlet, Universal Appeal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here, yeah. Otis Skinner's Hamlet is a creation at once poetic, sensitive, and vital. Oh, uh -huh. yes, look at this. Yeah, that's, that's In the that's difficult that's role of Ophelia, yeah, 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 Maud yeah, Durbin yeah. is excellent. Yeah, yes, here's another. His delineation of the melancholy In Dane the difficult was... difficult role of Ophelia, uh, Maud Durbin The melancholy is... Dane was magnificent, yes, even triumphant. Ha-ha! <laughs> <laughs> uh. Hamlet, pipe down. It's three o'clock in the morning. I beg your pardon, Sam. Shh, darling, we forget I'll send these hotel walls off. Uh, any more reviews? Here's one. It says... The small but enthusiastic audience applauded vigorously. Small is right. When I looked out into the house tonight, all I could see was a yawning chasm of red plush. I felt positively lonesome, Maud. Oh, it's humiliating. It's discouraging. It's... Hey, didn't you hear me? Wipe down! I don't like the tone of that man's voice. Don't like it at all. Darling, what are you going to do? I'm going in there and give him and a... Give him a ticket for tomorrow night's performance. It'll be awfully comforting to know there'll be someone there. Hmm. Season after season, they plugged along, barely paying the trip's expenses, traveling by day coach, riverboat, and barge. It wasn't the life Maud had dreamt of when she married her matinee idol. It was uncomfortable, unglamorous, and the public stayed away from their performances in multitudes. One day, in a Kansas City streetcar, a small boy was reading the passing sign. What, son? Pop, what's an artist, Skinner? I don't know. Must be some kind of plow or something they use on a farm. Well, that is the last straw. You don't pay any attention, Otis. No, I, I don't mind for myself, but I, I worry, Maud. What, what kind of a life is this for you? We're playing in good plays. We're giving them fine productions. I suppose there are some people who haven't heard of you. You're building something for this country, Otis. Something good and solid. And when it's built, we'll have a real home. Oh, yes. And maybe a baby. Oh, darling. Do you think it will ever really happen? Someday, Maud, I'm convinced of it. Someday. But the someday kept melting further and further into the distant future. But when they arrived in Selma, Alabama... They had to remain in their wretched little hotel room because there wasn't any money left for food. Otis, what are you doing? I, I'm, I'm trying to study a part, Maud. No, you are. You were miles away just now. You were staring out the window. Yes, at the cafe sign across the street. Look at it. Eat. How can a man concentrate on his art when his belly is crying out for food? I don't know. I try not to think of it. When I do, I imagine things. So do I. Fried chicken. Mm. We've got a $20 gold piece. We'd better use it. But that's our good luck, Pete. Good luck. It's, a dis it's disgraceful that we should have to depend on it like superstitious gypsies. Oh, Maud, I, I should have gone into some other kind of work. I should have made a fine piano tuner, a steam fitter. I should have become a chef. Ah, chef. At least then you would never have gone hungry. You're a fine actor. Well, what's happening to the American theater? Doesn't anyone want to be entertained anymore? You're a wonderful manager, too. Oh, maybe I'm like the new recruit in the army. Everyone's out of step but me. I won't have you talking like that. You're going to bring great drama to the American people. Yes, come in. Mr. Skinner, package for you. Compliments of Mr. Siegfried O'Hara. Well, who on earth is that, Otis? He's one of the stagehands at the theater. He told me he's a farmer whenever there's no show in town. Thank you, boy. Thank you, sir. Ah, that's... Maud, look what Farmer O'Hara has sent us. A whole roast chicken. He must raise sarsaparilla on his farm, too. Huh. Look, four bottles. Well, dig in, darling. You have first choice on the drumsticks. Thank you, dear love. What is it? <laughs> Maudie. Oh, you mustn't cry now, please. I'm sorry. It's just that I'm afraid. Oh, try not to be, sweetheart. But I can't help it. I'm supposed to be eating for two now. And... What? Yes. 
But suppose our baby grows up with a taste for nothing but drumsticks and sarsaparilla. Oh. You're listening to Family Circle, starring Douglas Fairbanks as Otis Skinner and Cornelia Otis Skinner as your narrator on The Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. My father was a fine storyteller. And as I grew up, he told me all about the way things were with him and the lovely young actress he married, my mother, Maud Durbin. Before I arrived on the scene, they had one dream, bringing good plays to people all over America. From success in that dream, they believed, could come all sorts of other wonders. A normal life, a home, a child. But they were poor. Their tour had been a failure. And the one dream sure to come true, it seemed, was me. No respecter of money and fame. No, Maud, I'm determined. Yes, you look very determined indeed, dear love. Now, what is it tonight? That no child of ours shall be born in any ragtag theatrical trunk. No, ma'am, you're going to go to a good hospital where you'll have the best care money can buy. But, Otis, how on earth will we pay the hospital bills? Maudie, you know what a prestidigitator is? A magician. I've always thought I should have a spare act up my sleeve, something I could fall back on when Shakespeare failed me. Well... You're going to go to a hospital. So from now on, you may bill me as Otis Skinner, prestidigitator extraordinary. The audience for my debut into the world was a dress circle of doctors and nurses in Chicago. As the star of that show, I was so expensive that Father had to go on the road by himself during that summer to pay for me. And as I grew, Mother abandoned her career as an actress in favor of me. But we traveled with Father wherever he went. My parents' dream of making a home was still far from coming true until Mother discovered a cottage in the country near Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Now, Maud, you know you won't be happy there. Why, we'll be separated two-thirds of the time. I know. Otis, do you remember the inscription on that stone in the Metairie Cemetery? I'd never forget it. Always, in their separate dreams, one love. I'll manage, dearest. But why should you have to manage? Things are easier for us now. Hotel life isn't too difficult, not in the big city. Well, I wouldn't care for myself, but it's for the baby, for Bob. Oh, don't you see, Otis? If we're ever to have a home, it must be started while she's young. In the country, she'll have a place to play. She'll have the life a child ought to have. Being on the road without you won't be the same. But, darling, you'll have a home to come back to for the first time. And there'll be people about who aren't in the theater, who can talk about something else besides show business. Baby Cornelia need never even hear the word stage. You're right. And I know it. But all I can think of is how much I'll be missing you when I'm taking my bow off in Paducah alone. Mother... Oh, Daddy, be home. Soon now, darling. Go to sleep. Mother, listen. There's someone rides by the house on horseback every night. I'm scared of them. I'll tell you a secret. Sometimes I am, too. And then I think of a boy over in Scotland named Robert Louis Stevenson. And the poem he wrote. What was it, Mother? Whenever the moon and the stars are set, Whenever the wind is high, all night long in the dark and wet, a man goes riding by. Uh, I pretend dead. Late in the night, when the fires are out, why does he gallop and gallop about? Whenever the trees are crying aloud and ships are tossed at sea, by on the highway, low and loud, by the gallop goes he. Cornelia. Good night, baby. Then one wonderful day, Father signed under the management of the great Charles Froman for the play called The Duel. It meant 
starring on Broadway at last. But to me, it also meant wonder of wonders that he could come home on weekends. There he is, Bob. Look, he's wearing this elegant new greatcoat. Father, Father. Hello, Maud. Oh, Hello, dear. person. Father, did you see my snow? Certainly I saw it. We're going belly whopping on your sled this very afternoon. My goodness. Won't that be too much exercise for an old party? Oh, oh, oh. oh listen to her, Morty. You'd think we're a pair of subterranearians. Oh, that's funny. Mother told me you're a, a pesky digitator. Oh, she did. Uh, she still thinks so. I eh? do. <laughs> well, that calls for a celebration. Give us a kiss, Mother. One from you, too, person. And let's go home. And their dream of a home was realized during the years that followed. For Mother had a gift, not only for keeping our family circle snug and happy, but for charming the ever-widening circle of father's friends. James Whitcomb Riley, E.H. Southern, Julia Marlowe, George Aide, Booth Tarkington, all fell under the spell of Maud Skinner's warmth and radiance. Sometimes, though, her loyal family spirit nearly ruined us, as when, during the First World War, father was promoting the sale of Liberty Bonds to his audiences between the acts of his current play. On this night, Mother and I were sitting in a box. Yes, the Liberty Bond means victory over there for our boys, ladies and gentlemen. But to me, it means a great deal more than even victory. As an actor, I have traveled to many a little town and great city in this land. I have come to know and love dearly the whole breadth of it, the country which gives a man the opportunity to develop his talent freely, to do with it as he wishes. And I'm grateful for that freedom, so grateful that I will personally match with my own purchase each $50 Liberty Bond bought by you here tonight. Isn't he wonderful, Cornelia? So magnetic. Well, friend, no auctioneer has given you such an opportunity to purchase such an heirloom. But the item I am offering you tonight is priceless. It is Liberty. Do I hear a bit, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Skinner, I'll take a $50 bond. Thank you, Captain. Thank you. Friends, friends, this young officer who has been wounded in the service of his country has shown you the way. Who will be the next? I will. Mother, mother, please. Mr. Skinner, I will take a $50 bond for every uniformed man in this theater. You will? I will. Um, Electrician, turn on the house lights, please. Uh, Mother, didn't you know? Tonight, Daddy invited a whole regiment of soldiers. Oh, no. We were lucky that Father had a talent for business, as well as for acting. Otherwise, we should never have met that obligation. As for me... During those years, I scorned all talents except those connected with the institutions spoken of in hushed tones as the theater. While Father was delighting the nation as Philippe Rideau in the honor of the family, Hodge the beggar in Kismet, and the hurdy-gurdy man in Mr. Antonio, I was dreaming of the triumphs I would have as a great tragedian. Oh, I was going to be Dooza, Bernard and Majeska, all rolled up into one. Father just smiled sweetly allowed me a walk on in his starring Broadway play, Blood and Sand. And when the curtain had fallen on that heart-stopping first night. Well, person, you made it. You didn't fall on your face in front of everybody either. Was I? Was I dramatic? Very. Mr. Skinner, they're calling for you. Another curtain call. All right. Come on, Bob. Well, you're not taking me out there to bow with you. I am. Your mother expects it. Come on. Panic and delight, he led me onto the stage and down to the footlights. We both bowed, first to the audience, then to each other. Then the curtain came down and I squeezed my hand and smiled. Well, miss, you've made your New York baby. From now on, you're on your own. After that night, Otis Skinner took in many another bow for audiences all over the world. And when the curtain finally came down for him and for his leading lady, Maud Durbin, there was one person especially who remembered his courage 
his talent and his wonderful stories. The third person in our family circle, myself. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade, Family Circle, by Cornelia Otis Skinner, was adapted for radio by Virginia Radcliffe, was directed by Jack Zoller. The part of Maud was played by Patricia Ryan. Music was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryan. Mr. Fairbanks will soon appear in his own production of The O'Flynn. This is Ted Pearson speaking. Cavalcade of America comes to you each week from the stage of the Longacre Theater on Broadway in New York, and is presented by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.